Hi, I'm Mike Ungerman of the Central Florida Computer Society. Today we'll continue with the fourth in a series on electric vehicles. In our previous presentations, we've reviewed the technology of electric vehicles or EVs and how batteries and EVs work with a focus on lithium ion batteries. Today, we're going to take a look at the way ahead in batteries for EVs, improving how, how lithium ion batteries are made and packaged, as well as the chemistry to produce alternatives that are more efficient and safer to use. Lithium ion batteries are the most common in EVs today. And like this battery pack from Tesla, the most commonly used type of battery in electric vehicles due to their high energy density, lightweight, and long life. However, there are some risks associated with the use of these batteries. There is a potential of thermal runaway resulting in explosion and or fire. Lithium ion batteries are prone to thermal runaway, a situation in which the battery begins to rapidly increase its temperature due to an internal chemical reaction. This can occur when the battery is overcharged, short-circuited, exposed to extensive temperatures, or damaged in some way. Thermal runaway can cause the battery to swell, leak, and even catch fire, posing a significant risk to users and property. To prevent thermal runaway, lithium ion batteries must be designed and manufactured with careful attention to safety protocols. Battery manufacturers must also ensure that their batteries are properly tested and certified to meet industry standards. Exposure to water, if damaged, resulting in hard to control fires. Fires can erupt from water intrusion of lithium ion battery packs due to accidental damage or exposure to water from floods and major storms. The chemistry of batteries containing lithium ion have this inherent risk. Also, the potential to lose capacity over time. Another concern with lithium ion batteries is the potential for them to lose capacity over time. This is caused by the repeated charging and discharging of the battery, which can cause the cells to degrade. This can lead to reduced performance and range as well as increased charging time. I'll move my mouse over this graph and you can see that the vertical axis is percentage of charging range and then mileage in kilometers. So we start off here at zero kilometers and 100% of battery range. The running average is this red line, which really isn't that bad overall, coming down to approximately 95% up to 100,000 kilometers. But it does show in this scattergram what the decline in the battery range would be over time. The next several slides focus on alternatives that are either in production today or being planned for 2023 and 24. The battery pack you see here is made by Toyota using solid state technology. Solid state batteries, although still of lithium ion chemistry, offer a number of advantages. They can be made much thinner and lighter. They have a much higher energy density, storing more energy in the same size, allowing more range on a single charge. Solid state batteries also charge much faster. And they're more durable and can withstand extreme temperatures and vibration, lowering some of the risks we looked at of using lithium ion batteries in EVs. Lithium sulfur batteries, they're coming and they'll be on sale soon. Sony claims the new technology will have a 40% higher energy density and lower production costs than today's lithium ion batteries. There are issues as the electrodes degrade too fast at the moment for commercial applications, but a number of institutions are working on a solution for this stumbling block. Lithium sulfur might be sort of a halfway house replacement for lithium ion rather than a radical successor, but it is on the way and it will be a significant improvement. 
zinc iron batteries. They're under development with a non-combustible water-based electrolyte solution. The active materials used in zinc iron batteries are very energy dense, allowing for sufficiently high energy to be stored. The manufacturing of zinc iron batteries can be scaled up from current lithium iron manufacturing, manufacturing processes since it doesn't require the strict controls over lithium's processing. This allows for the conversion of existing processes and shortens the time from manufacturing to consumer. The batteries have a longer service life than lithium ion, resulting in a far lower cost of storage. The following several slides look into the forecast for battery technology over the next several years. Some may never see production, but are tempting. Aluminum air batteries, they're a viable technology, but they're a primary battery and it doesn't recharge. Consider it like your flashlight battery. An aluminum air battery relieves the hassle of finding a charging station. They have a very high energy density, eight to nine times greater than current lithium ion batteries. It's estimated that an aluminum air battery pack in an EV would last about 5,400 miles. Swapping out a depleted aluminum air battery for a recycled one is much cheaper than the cost of swapping out a Tesla battery. And the replaceable parts needed are the aluminum plates, which can be 100% recycled. You pay only for the miles you drive. Is this better than lithium? Redox flow batteries may be in the far future for EVs. Redox flow battery science is already sound and in production, but for large scale power storage. If developed to smaller form factors, they could have significant effects for electric vehicles in terms of improved energy density, safer operation, battery life, and cost. Other similar flow design batteries are also in play. One uses organic compounds to replace scarce vanadium in present designs. Aluminum graphite batteries. So here we're using aluminum in a slightly different form. Stanford University has created an aluminum battery that could slash charging times. For example, a smartphone could, chain, could take a full charge in just 60 seconds and a car could charge in minutes. Wouldn't that be interesting? With an aluminum negatively charged cathode and a graphite anode, it's safe, lightweight, and it does have the potential for improved energy density. Unfortunately, the development isn't even close to a perfect commercially viable aluminum graphite battery, but it could be one to watch in the future. As I researched YouTube videos for supporting battery technology, I added them to a playlist to share with our viewers. This is an active list with videos relating to today's presentation at the top of the list chronologically. They will update as I discover and add new ones. Feel free to browse them at your leisure. The URL, I use bit.ly slash ev dash batteries and this will be published uh in future issues of the tech for senior newsletter so that's bit.ly slash ev dash batteries so although lithium ion batteries are the mainstay of today's ev technology Alternatives do exist today, which are appearing in 2023 EV production and more are being developed for 2024 and beyond. Keep in mind, as fantastic as the future technology seems today, remember that a lot of yesterday's science fiction is now science fact. My next videos will focus on the charging of your EV, including charging at home, charging at commercial charging stations, and even swapping out your entire battery pack on a regular basis when it needs charging. Mastering Chat GPT 
three key strategies for improved results in your conversations. I'm Huey Poplock. Are you struggling to get answers you need from ChatGPT? Don't worry, I've got you covered with some helpful tips to make the most of this powerful AI chatbot from OpenAI. ChatGPT has become incredibly popular among people from all walks of life, including teachers, lawyers, programmers, and content creators, as it's an all-in-one tool for tackling problems that can be expressed in words. However, randomly throwing questions at ChatGPT won't guarantee you get amazing results that others have experienced. To get the most out of ChatGPT, you'll need to try some of these helpful techniques. Describe a preferred complexity of response. Although ChatGPT is highly intelligent, it has limitations in understanding certain requests that human could grasp easily. If you encounter a scenario where ChatGPT fails to provide a satisfactory answer or declines to respond altogether, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's incapable of providing a correct answer. It could simply be due to the phrasing of the question being incomprehensible to ChatGPT. In such situations, try rephrasing the question multiple times until you obtain a suitable response from ChatGPT. Let's take a look at some examples. I'm logged into chatopenai.com. I also am logged into my account. And let's take a look at describing a preferred complexity of response. First, let's try what are the key features and benefits of cloud computing and how does it differ from traditional IT infrastructure? And it completes our conversation. I'm not gonna read this all to you, but you can get an idea of what it's doing and how it's saying it. Let's take a look at a couple of the items as it's printing. Okay, next, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, describe it a little bit better. We're going to have the same question, but this time we're going to say, explain it like I'm a five-year-old. So we put at the end of it, explain like I'm a five-year-old. It's saying basically the same thing, but in a much different uh, uh, tone and language. Let's try it one more time, but this time we're going to say explain in football terms. Again, it's basically the same answer, but in a different context and more in tune to maybe what your audience uh, or what you need to have uh, in your explanation. So you want to describe a preferred complexity of response or all kinds of things that you could ask it to do. Get industry specific or niche response. Since ChatGPT is designed to be a versatile chatbot, its responses may be generalized and include words or concepts that are not relevant to your specific context or niche of interest. However, with a few adjustments, you can fine tune ChatGPT's responses to align with a particular industry, niche, or profession. 
For instance, if you're discussing the legal profession, you may want ChatGPT to use legal terminology instead of everyday language. To achieve this, you can prompt ChatGPT to adopt a legal persona and provide further instructions that are specific to the legal industry. This will enable ChatGPT to provide context and industry-specific responses, making the conversation more relevant and informative. Get industry-specific or niche response. Let's try this statement. Just in general, describe the health aspects of a smartwatch. And this is a very general response to that comment. The next way we're going to approach this is by saying, I want you to answer as a doctor. Though it's in much more medical terms and talking about it from the medical point of view. Our next try with using the same idea, but instead of a doctor, this time we're going to be asking for it to be answered like a computer nerd. It's in a much more technical uh, aspect as opposed to it being a medical or just a general description. When using ChatGPT, not only can it simulate an entity, it can also generate responses in various styles. The possibilities are endless and entirely up to your imagination. For instance, you can prompt it to compose a poem in the Shakespearean language, or ask it to craft a song imitating the style of your preferred musician or songwriter. Get ChatGPT to respond in specific styles. The first one we're going to say is, let's ask it to write me a happy birthday poem. Very nice, very general. Let's try it next in the style of Shakespeare. And as you can see, it's as you read it down, it's much as if it were written by Shakespeare. Let's try one more style. Let's have a happy birthday poem in the style of a limerick. And you can see a much different way of looking at that same question and getting a much different response, yet a very good one. At times, ChatGPT may encounter prompts that require lengthy responses, and as a result, the response may get truncated midway. To resolve this issue, a straightforward solution is to prompt ChatGPT with the phrase continue for regular text or continue code for an incomplete code block. This will enable ChatGPT to continue generating a complete response without any interruptions. Our fourth or bonus prompt is prompt ChatGPT to continue. Let's pick this particular Question, what's the difference between a Mac computer and a PC? And as you can see, it tells us many things. 
But let's say it's, you know, we really need a much longer question than that. So all we have to do is type in continue. And it picks up right from where we were and adds more information to our article. So use the continue to make your article longer. To sum up what I've been talking about, get creative to enjoy ChatGPT. One of the best things about ChatGPT is there are no hard rules. You don't necessarily have to follow a rigid formula to use the AI chatbot. How much you can utilize a chatbot boils down to how creative you can get with your prompts. Well, you're welcome to use all of the hacks that I've mentioned. Uh, you'll need creativity to solve your own unique problems using ChatGPT. I'm Huey Poplock. Today, I'm going to show you how to find anything using everything on a PC. I'm Huey Poplock. That's right. I like to find files quickly. Windows doesn't really give us a chance to do so. I'm going to use a program that I've talked about many times, but I've never really demonstrated in detail. We're going to try to do that today using everything by Void Tools. If you use Windows Search or Cortana, you'll find a few files on your system, and then it'll say, well, let's go to Windows Explorer and see what we can find. When you do that and you put in your search, you will find that it takes quite a bit of time. I have three screen captures here. The first one about five minutes in, the second one about nine minutes in, and the last one about 30 minutes in when it finally finished. So it takes a long time just to find one term when you're searching with Windows Explorer. When you are searching using everything, as soon as you open it, it's ready to go and it finds everything within a second. This is the website voidtools.com where you can download the installer, where you can download a portable version as well. Let's take a look at a live demo. Let's open up everything. As soon as we do, it's there and we can start searching. So let's use the term CFCS to search. And it now has found 1,540 objects. And it does the folders first. And as we scroll down, you can see there's a lot of items there. As we scroll down, then we get the files. There are some that are Excel spreadsheets and PDF files and all kinds of files. And we can sort in several ways. And we're going to take a look at some different ways in which we can sort. First, we are sorting alphabetically with the folders at the top. If we click the name, we reverse that. So now we're starting at the Z under the files. Then we go to the folder. So we can search alphabetically from A to Z, Z to A. We can sort by the path and then we can reverse that and it will do the G and C. And I'm going to talk about how you set that up in a moment. You can do by size. So you can have the largest file at the top. In this case, it's uh, two gigabytes or you can go to the smallest. Those are folders, so there's not sizes, but then we start at 1K. Or you can go by date modified to the date that I'm recording this, which is the 7th of August. Or you can reverse it and go to the oldest file using the CFCS by folder is 2012. The oldest file by itself is 1998 on my hard drive. Now there's different views you can have. Right now, we're looking at the details. You can have medium thumbnails, you can have large thumbnails, and you can have extra large thumbnails. Let's look at different items that you can search. You can search everything, which is what we're set at now, but you can only look at audio files, compressed files, documents, executables, just folders, just pictures, or just videos. Another thing that we can do under view we can have a preview window. That means if we click this, we see a preview of it. So you can adjust that. But you can also adjust 
your column sizes so we can have all the information and see it here. You see the ability to change and it changes very quickly. There's a couple of things I want to show you under tools and under options. First one is folders. I have a D drive, which is an SD card, and G is my Google Drive. So I can search my Google Drive as well by adding it under folders. And I can exclude certain things. I don't want to show hidden files and folders. I don't want to show any system file. And in most cases, when I'm looking for a file, I'm not looking for something. It's going to be either a hidden or a system file. If I'm sure that that's what a file is that I'm looking for, then I might want to uncheck those. But I'm going to keep them checked. I'm going to say, oh, it does take a few seconds when you make that. Now it's sorting them and it's done. So now it doesn't have any of the hidden files or any of the system files. So if I type in Huey, you will see all of the folders that have Huey, but let's now search for any video files that have my name in it. And you will see that there are several. They're right there. I want to look at any document that has my name in it. You will see that even documents, if I click on it, I will get, sometimes takes a few seconds for it to load the file to show you the preview. I want to look for pictures. And then I can go back to search everything. Now let's say I want to find Chromebook. You can see I have a lot of files there. And if I wish, I only want to find on G. I want to look at my Google Drive and you can see that it shows everything that's on my Google Drive. So I put a space there in the word screen. I will see the word screen and only those items that are on my Google Drive. So people ask, can I search my Google Drive? Well, this is a way which you can search your Google Drive. You're not going to do it from your Chromebook, but you can do it from your PC. Find what you want, know where it is, and then go to your Chromebook and then work with it. Let's look at a few ways that I use everything. First, I want to find some files that I know were in the folder when I was working on website of the week. And as I start to type in website, you'll notice that it keeps changing with each letter. And as I continue to type, it found all of the website of the weeks. I'm looking for something in 13. So I'm going to come down here to that folder. And it could be even a file where that folder is. But I'm going to find that folder. And I'm going to right mouse click. And I'm going to come up here to open path. I'm going to click on open path. It opens up my Windows Explorer to that folder. And all of the files and subfolders that are there then I can find the file that I'm looking for. I'm looking for a file that I created in a program called Microsoft Publisher. I know all of the files that Publisher creates are .pub. So if I hit the star or asterisk .pub, it will find the asterisk is a wildcard. So it'll find any file that has the extension PUB. So I can come down here, I can find what I'm looking for, and I know that it's that file, or it probably is. I can tell it to open the path. It opens the folder that has that file in it, and then I can pick and choose which one I want to use. Often, I lose a file. I might save it and can't remember where I saved it to right after I saved it, or I was clicking and dragging a file and dropped it in the wrong place. Now, how would I find it? Well, let's give an example. I'm going to open up a web page. I'm still on vid tools, and let's say I want to find support and everything, and there's something on here that I want to capture. So I do a screen capture. I happen to use a program called Snagit. You may use something else, but this is what I'm using. So we're going to take this information. We're going to tell it, okay, grab it and save it and save as, and we'll say uh, test number one. 
and I say save and I close it saved it I close this I didn't pay attention to where I was saving it so how do we do that we'll minimize this we called it doesn't matter what we called it maybe I don't even remember what I called it what am I going to do I am going to look under date modified but I know that I saved it as a JPEG so let's first tell it we want to look for pictures now we're going to go to date modified we're going to sort find the last one and there it is right at the top because it's the last picture that I saved I just click on it I can look at the preview and that's what I wanted and here is where it is and so I can now right mouse click and open the path okay it's in the articles for the blog is for this article but maybe that's not where I want it I can place it wherever I want now that I know where it is and I can even rename it if I didn't like the title that I was using so very quickly you can find what you last saved even if you can't remember the name or where you saved it to how to find anything using everything on a PC I'm Huey Poplock.